Good evening, friends. Good evening. Welcome to this evening's carol service and festival Eucharist. We're really happy you're here. I hope you're ready to sing. Sing lots. So we will begin with the carol service portion. So turn to page four in your bulletins.
on this sacred night, we have a dream that no empire should tax the poor or uproot them, that no unmarried mother should be put away in disgrace, that no door will be shut on those who desperately need it to be open, that shepherds and sheep and all of nature need not be afraid anymore, that barbed wire and angry soldiers may not be found in Bethlehem, that wise women and wise men might appear in Jerusalem, in Ukraine, in Honduras, that children may be protected from those who would abuse them, that in this moment, worship may become a manger and the church a stable and the rumor a reality that Christ has come among us.
waited. And imagined the Savior. We imagined power. One the world, but stronger than on our side. We imagined a king on a white horse wielding a sword. We got a baby born in a stable among the livestock. We imagined the work done for us through the destruction of our enemies. We received a baby who will teach us our calling to seek reconciliation and to love extravagantly. Let us rejoice in the unexpected babe of Bethlehem. Praise to the wisdom of love. May God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of glory, your splendor shines from a manger in Bethlehem, where the light of the world is humbly born into the darkness of human night. Open our eyes to see Christ's presence in the shadows of our world, so that we, like him, may become beacons of your justice and defenders of all for whom there is no room. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. 
and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the God of hosts will do this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Santo Evangelio de nuestro Salvador Jesucristo, según Lucas. Por aquel tiempo, el emperador Augusto ordenó que se hiciera un censo de todo el mundo. Este primer censo fue hecho siendo Quirinio gobernador de Siria. Todos tenían que ir a inscribirse a su propio pueblo. Por esto, José salió del pueblo de Nazaret, de la región de Galilea, y se fue a Belén, en Judea, donde había nacido el rey David, porque José era descendiente de David. Fue allá a inscribirse junto con María, su esposa, que se encontraba en cinta. Y sucedió que mientras estaban en Belén, le llegó a María el tiempo de dar a luz. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord, This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host 
praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. The first and great difference between primitive religions thought and the world religions is that primitive peoples maintain a sense of mystery through their bond with nature. The world religions sever the relationship and attempt to establish a new, more comprehensible one. Vine Deloria Jr., amen. Please be seated. <coughs> A week ago last Sunday, while we were experiencing the power of Mary's Magnificat here, the Financial Times broke a story that made headlines for a couple days and then disappeared into the sunset as our short attention span news cycle encourages. They reported that scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory had done it. At 1.03 a.m. on December the 5th, for the first time in history, a fusion reaction was initiated that created more energy than it took to produce it. Fusion, the process of merging atoms, is the reaction that the sun produces naturally and continually. It is how we get sunlight and warmth. It is what makes the stars shine. It is what powers the sun and the stars and makes life on our planet possible. For decades, fusion experiments have continually taken taking more energy to produce than they generated. That is why the event from a couple weeks ago was such a breakthrough. If the reaction that was achieved can be replicated on a large scale, and that is admittedly still a big if, it means that we could produce energy without radioactive waste. It means there would be no need to ever produce a greenhouse gas ever again. It holds the potential of saving our Earth from the destruction it is presently undergoing as a result of our contaminated energy production. It would be clean, it would be cheap, and it would be as close, as limitless as we can imagine. It is, in short, the holy grail of energy production. Of course, moving from a laboratory setting into the real world is full of its own challenges. The idealists estimate that it will take a decade to come up with a methodology to do this on a large-scale basis. Most, however, believe it will take closer to three decades. But on December 5th, that eventual possibility was born. Will it be soon enough to avert the most catastrophic aspects of the climate crisis? Of course, no one knows. It is a different birth that you came here to celebrate tonight. That birth took place 2,027 years ago, give or take a year. When it occurred, it had even fewer days in the spotlight than the fusion birth received. That would be zero. No one paid any attention to the birth of another brown baby to another teenage mother in a barn outside some godforsaken village in the Middle East. Save for some sheep and a few poverty-stricken shepherds, no one knew and no one cared. Despite the lack of fanfare, however, and what appeared to be the ho-hum nature of this birth, 
Like the fusion birth, it was an event that had never before occurred in history. And it would also lead to the Holy Grail, the actual one. <laughs> we now call that phenomenon incarnation, a bodily manifestation of a divine being. Now that was a religious notion that was just as preposterous then as it is now. The world religions of the day were all polytheistic, and all of those hundreds of gods, whether they be Roman or Greek, Canaanite or Babylonian, Egyptian or Philistine, all existed in another plane of existence only. The objective of worship in the empire where Jesus was born was to gain the blessing of those gods or at least to appease them because they controlled your life from afar. And they could be quite random and temperamental in how they chose to do that. These gods visited the earth but not to assist created beings, as the birth we celebrate tonight would, but rather to mess with it. Most often, that meant taking part in a carnal act with a human, and then immediately returning to God status. It was not incarnation, it was shape-shifting. That is what made tonight's religious event so bizarrely different. There was only one God in first century Judaism, and the story of tonight makes the absurd claim that this one God became a historically verifiable figure who came to earth to actually be a flesh and blood person. This divine being would be as vulnerable as any baby on this planet. This supernatural presence would then experience what it was like to be a finite individual, having the joys and the sufferings of any other being on a tiny planet in the Milky Way galaxy, one of the billions of such galaxies in the vast expanse of interstellar space, to quote one of our Eucharistic prayers. It would be a God who would experience the creation they, they themselves invented. In fact, this God would not just experience it, but be an actual part of that creation. That is the essence of the original Christmas story. The spark that created the universe, the entity responsible for the sun and the stars and the planet, the eternal being that invented fusion, joined the world to experience that fusion. The Eternal One actually became material and was born to become one with this planet, just like you and me and thousands of other species. This impossible story, our Christmas story, is what sets apart Christianity from the other faith traditions then and now. Our sister tradition, for example, Islam, teaches us about the Holy Other, the God who is too unknowable to even comprehend. But tonight, we present to the world a God who is the Holy Us. We have the audacity to believe in a God who is so intimate that this being becomes part of the Eternal One's own creation. If the implications of the fusion birth this month are monumental, then this birth, if true, have to be beyond gargantuan, the most significant moment since the Big Bang. The fact that Jesus became flesh not only bonds the eternal essence of the universe to you and me and every human being before or since, but it also unites that eternal presence with every creature on this planet. Incarnation unites God with the plants and the rocks and the rivers and the oceans. It brings God into an intimate relationship with the entire biological diversity of this planet. It means the cosmic dust that makes up the ant and the polar bear, the stars and the sun, are also a part of the divine presence. 
If Christmas is true, salvation can never be about detaching ourselves from earth to get to this God in some other plane of existence. Incarnation Christmas has to mean that the entire earth is part of God's reality, God's body, in fact. It, too, must warrant salvation. It is impossible to believe in the Christmas story without believing in the sanctity of the entire earth. Christmas means that we are intimately connected with all of creation and the Creator at the same time. It means that the divine is part of the world we are destroying. It means that when we undo the web of creation, we are taking part in the most sacrilegious act possible. Now let me ask you, is that what you learned about the meaning of Christmas? Has anyone ever suggested to you that the most important lesson in the Christmas story is that because God became incarnate, became part of the earth, that we are called to embrace all of the natural world? Did any of you learn that the nativity scene with all of the animals is a symbol of the love we are supposed to have for all the creatures of the earth? Did you learn that the word becoming flesh can only mean that we, like God, must be interconnected with the planet and protect it no matter what? But when you put this story into historical context, I don't see any other way to reach any other conclusion. So what happened? How in the world do we go from Christmas teaching us that God became material to us turning the material objects of the world into disposable items for us to consume as Christmas presents. Now, I am confident that the early church never lost the real meaning of Christmas because early theologians talk about this. Take, for example, Arrhenius in the second century, battling the first major heresy in the church. He uses the Christmas story to blow up the dualism in Gnosticism. Gnostics argued that only the spiritual world was good and all things material were inherently evil. Well, if that's the case, Arrhenius argues, how is it that Jesus became flesh, became part of the material world himself? I would suggest that the church held on to the real meaning of Christmas until the third century. That is when the fledgling Christian community came to the land of the Celts and the Druids. Now, you might think that this would be a good thing because both of those cultures were already deeply connected to the land and its creatures. The Christmas story had to fit right in with their understanding. But when Celts told the Christian missionaries that the tree in front of them was God, the missionaries were horrified. God isn't a tree. God is up there, they professed. The religion that was different from all the other world religions, the religion that insisted that God was incarnated on Christmas Day, the religion that taught the world about the intimacy of the divine with all of nature, threw it all out because of its fear of pantheism. They turned the God of imminence that Christmas teaches us into a God who is only transcendent, only a presence in another plane of existence like all those other gods from the faith traditions that surrounded Judaism in the first century. The truth is there were virtually no similarities between the gods of Rome and Canaan and the God we experience in early Christianity. But with the Celts and the Druids, there is just a hair's breadth of theological difference. Both teach us of a divine presence that is material, that is part of the earth. Both stress God's intimacy with all of creation. But the missionaries were blinded to the religious connections because they understood the the Celts and the Druids as backwards cultures. That is when I believe we lost tonight. That is when the real Christmas disappeared. 
And that is when alienation between humans and creation was reintroduced as part of our theology. I am certain the missionaries had no idea just how destructive that decision would be. But because of it, Christianity began teaching that this planet was only a stopping off point for us on our journey to God. How many of you have heard that? And in so doing, the destruction of creation began in earnest. Nothing had changed by the time a new crop of missionaries were sent to the new world in the 16th century and beyond. The religions of the indigenous people of North America were seen as just as primitive as the Celts and Druids. To stamp them out, we continued to suppress the incarnational message of Jesus so that we could keep God up in the heavens. If Judaism's great gift to the world is monotheism, then Christianity's gift to the world is Christmas, is incarnation. But not only did we take that gift away from everyone else, but we took it away from ourselves. In so doing, we have been in large part responsible for the climate crisis in which we find ourselves today. If the true meaning of Christmas had stuck if we had continued to show the world the intimate relationship between the divine and the natural world, if we had continued to celebrate Christmas as the feast day when we embraced the entire planet because God was in it, just imagine the world we would be living in now. We would not desperately need human fusion because we would have been living in God's fusion. We would not be wondering how to prevent the extinction of the animals of this planet because we would have been protecting them all along, knowing that they are a sacred part of God. We would not be dealing with the pollution of our air and water because we would have seen that pollution for what it is, a desecration of the divine. Beloved, on this sacred night... The truth is so simple. Christmas can save us. All we need to do is bring it back. All we need to do is reintroduce incarnation to a broken world. All we need to do is see again the power of a divine baby born in the back of beyond. So let us apologize to our indigenous sisters and brothers for not uniting with them centuries ago. And then let us celebrate. Celebrate the real Christmas. Celebrate the interconnectedness of our faith traditions with the entire cosmos. Celebrate our intimacy with a God who is part of us. Celebrate the religious fusion found in the Christmas experience and the scientific fusion discovered in a lab a few weeks ago. Let us celebrate that most impossible, unimaginable, fantastical, theological notion ever. And then let us give that gift to the entire world so that all creation will be free and healthy once again. That is a Christmas worth saving. That is a Christmas that will save all of us and all of God's interconnected creation. Amen.
Let us say together a Christmas creed found on page 19. I believe in Jesus Christ and in the power of the gospel begun in Bethlehem. I believe in the one whose spirit glorified a small village of whose coming shepherds saw the sign and for whom there was no room at the inn. I believe in the one whose life changed the course of history, over whom the rulers of the earth had no power and who was not understood by the proud. I believe in the one to whom the oppressed, the discouraged, the afflicted, the sick, the blind, the injured gave welcome and accept as savior. I believe in the one who, with love, changed the heart of the proud, and with his life showed that it is better to serve than to be served, and that the greatest joy is giving your life for others. I believe in peace, which is not the absence of war, but justice among all people and nations, and love among all. I believe in reconciliation, forgiveness, and the transforming power of the gospel. I believe that Christmas is strength and power, and that this world can change if, with humility and faith, we kneel before the manger. I believe that I must be the first one to do so. Amen. Now let us pray for the world and all that is in it, giving thanks for God's abundance. Enjoy and thanksgiving at Christ's birth. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth peace, goodwill through all creation. We pray for all people, for all welcome messengers of good news. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth peace, goodwill through all creation. For the nations and their rulers, for the corporations and their executives, for anyone with power over the lives of others. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth peace, goodwill through all creation. For those who defend the helpless, for those who strive for justice, for those who work to find a way to peace, for all the world and all who live in it. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth and peace, the will through all creation. For anyone suffering, sick, alone, afraid, or in any kind of trouble, Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth and peace, goodwill through all creation. For our own community, for friends, neighbors, and family near and far, especially those we name now. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth peace, goodwill through all For those who have died, especially the 40,000 killed in the U.S. this year and 604 mass shootings, we remember them and their families and friends. We plead for a ban on all assault weapons. We also pray for those we name now. Let us sing to our God a new song. On earth peace, goodwill through all creation. We offer thanksgiving for Mary's firstborn son. Good news of great joy. Jesus, how clearly we see you on Christmas, cradled by Mary, protected by Joseph, worshipped by the shepherds, honored by kings, enshrined in our displays, and loved by the world. 
But, oh God, help us look for you too among the storms of life and the wanderings of worn-out refugees and asylum seekers in the world's smelly stables and in makeshift mangers, in sweat-like drops of blood and rough-hewn crosses, humanly fashioned. Help us look, God, and help us find you not only at Christmas but throughout the coming year. And on this night of wonder, may God's peace be with all of you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace. Have a seat, everyone. Welcome to you all. We're so happy you are here. Grateful to see you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you on this great Christmas Eve night. Uh, just a few uh, announcements for you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to also welcome everybody who is live streaming this event. So uh, welcome to everybody who's at home doing this also. We are taking up an offering this year. Yes, you can wave to all the people at home. There are cameras right there. That's good. Go for it. Absolutely. We will take up an offering today uh, in the pews. Uh, so that will happen like it used to back in the old days when we, before COVID. Uh, but when it gets to the end of your row, if you'll just pass it to the person behind you, that would be great. If you are at home, you can take part in that by going to tinyurl.com slash GSP support. Thank you for all of that. We will have communion today in two kinds, in bread and wine, but the wine will be by intinction only, meaning that I will place it in, place your bread in the wine for you and hand it to you. So what I would like you to do when you come up is to give me a, a signal of one or two one means you just want bread, and two means you would like me to intinct your bread in the wine, okay? And that way only one person is touching your bread and nobody else is touching the cup, and we think that is as safe as can possibly be. So, uh, so feel free to take part in that in whichever way you feel comfortable. Remember that everyone is welcome to communion in this church, regardless of your faith tradition or where you are on your spiritual journey. Tomorrow, we will be back here at 10 a.m. for our Christmas Day service. For those of you who want to make sure you don't miss any of our services, it's a completely different service than this one. So that's tomorrow at 10. And then we'll be back next Sunday, January 1st, with our regular schedule, 7.45 in the morning and 10 in the morning. And that will be an epiphany service. We're also going to have an epiphany service January 5th at 5 p.m. That's going to be a Taze service right here, which should be fun. After this service, we will have eggnogs and snacks for you in the hall with a vent moving air through there constantly. So if you'd like to take part in that, please join us right after the service for that. One more liturgical issue. When we get to page 30 of your bulletin and you see uh, the song there is Silent Night, Holy Night, if you look closely, you will see if you have a small bulletin that the wrong words are there. We had a computer burp in the middle of this run. 
So we are singing Silent Night right there, and you should have an insert in your bulletin with Silent Night on it, okay? So pick up your Silent Night at that point. If you don't have an insert in your bulletin, there's this magical blue book in the pew, and, and Silent Night is on pay, is hymn number 111, okay? So that's another way to get there. Sorry for that, but um, it's crazy during the week before Christmas, let me tell you. And kids, kids, all kids, see me after the service when you're leaving because I have something for you, okay? We are so happy you are here on this Christmas Eve.
giver of life, receive all we offer you this day. God is with us. God is present here. Rejoice, lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to the Most High. Let us give thanks to the Holy One. It is right to offer thanks and praise. We thank you, loving God, for you did not abandon us or stand far off, but came in awe-filled nearness with the urgency of love. In creation's dawn, you gave birth to all that is. To the people of Israel, you revealed yourself a father and shared the human story. Now we praise you for the word made flesh, born tonight of Mary's body, nurtured in her womb, cradled in her arms, greeted by her song. The fullness of God dwells in his flesh, a touch of welcome for the one thrown aside, good news of bread for the hungry and poor, a shepherd to find those who are lost. Now we are caught up, body and soul resound with the glory of music divine echoing through the hallowed earth. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful caretakers and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Sarah and Abraham, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus, 
born into the human family this night and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all to set us free. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ is, is present, present tonight. tonight. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Mary, Joseph, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is revealed in the breaking of the bread. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Beloved, this is the body of Christ for the body of Christ. Be what you see, receive what you are.
Let us pray. May this eternal truth be always on our hearts, that the God who breathed this world into being placed stars into the heavens and designed a butterfly's wing is the God who entrusted his son to the care of ordinary people, became vulnerable that we might know how strong is the wonder of love, a mystery so deep it is impossible to grasp a mystery so beautiful, it is impossible to ignore. Amen. now here. Go forth to spread the good news wherever you go, sharing God's love and promise with all whom you meet. Go into the world to find the lost, heal the broken, 
Feed the hungry, release the prisoner, rebuild the nations, bring peace among people, and make music in every heart. Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, we cry out with the angels in the heavens and the shepherds in the fields. Alleluia! Our God is now here. Amen. into the night as those who have seen the Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. We will go to the 